Welcome back, everybody, to the Pitch Please podcast. Today, we're going to have a lot of fun. We've got some co-hosts in the room. we got three people from Dine. I'm excited to get into it. Uh, maybe what we'll do is we'll get Paula, our co-host, to introduce herself, and then we'll rip through the Dine team. Awesome. Hi, I'm Paula Campbell. I, uh, I actually work with Mike quite closely um, at Microsoft, supporting startups across Canada. Shout out, Founders Hub. <laughs> <laughs> Dine team. Oh, I guess it's my turn. Yeah, I want to learn what your names are, what you do at Dine. How's it going, everybody? Uh, My name is Manny Panahande. I am the Toronto lead for the Dine company. Um, I graduated UBC. That's where Dine was founded. I'm sure Arnav and Parsa can tell you all about that. And I'm very excited. Thank you, Mike, for having us. And uh, yeah, thanks. Hi, hello, everyone. My name is Arnav, and I'm the founder and CEO of Dine. So... Quite excited to be here. It's a pleasure to be hosted both by Paula and Mike. And I'm joined by my CTO and co-founder, Parsa. Over to you, Parsa. Yep. Uh, my name is Parsa. I'm the co-founder and CTO here at Dine. Uh, I handle all the tech questions and I'll let Arnab handle all the business questions because those aren't my, in my face. Uh, but I think Mike and I have had a bit of a history going back and forth on Azure and Bowtie. So I think we're getting to that today. Bowties and Azure, Bowties and Azure, the weirdest combination. <laughs> so, so maybe to learn, like, I'd love to maybe learn a little bit about how each of you got to Dine. And so maybe the most logical places, we'll start with you, Arnav, a little sure. bit about your background. And then don't give away everything about Dine. We need people to have on until that part of the presentation and dialogue. Yeah. But maybe talk a little bit about your own background and sort of where and what inspired you were starting to dine. And then I guess, logically, you guys can decide the order of whatever order you join dine in. And we'll go from there. Yeah, that'd be great. Awesome. Thank you. So dine, essentially, the story begins when I was about 16 years of age. So currently, I'm 23, by the way. So I had my first startup when I was 16, and it was an edtech company. It focused on delivering educational modules towards underprivileged communities in India. And it was quite fascinating to see how the community can come together and support each other in terms of providing education, support, and building a friendship, a bond, which people can pass on from one community to another. It also led me to host a lot of different leadership positions in terms of my high school experience, where I was part of hosting India's largest tech hackathon with over 120,000 people coming in, executing with a team of 200 people within just three months. And currently that event makes north of like $7 million each year. And we were able to do that when I was just 16 and 17. So after my first exit, I came down to UBC where I met both Parsa, Money and founded Dine. And Dine started during the pandemic where I saw that there was a huge market gap uh, in the restaurant space. And we thought of, you know, launching this fun little idea that connects people, makes my life a lot more easier. Like my best part of the job is, you know, I go into a lot of different restaurants, meet good people, eat good food. I'm not complaining. I'm a big foodie. And at the same time, help these small businesses scale. So that's how Dine came to be that I was a serial entrepreneur once. I always enjoyed building teams, building communities together. And when we saw a problem that was not getting addressed, we thought of getting some of the best foodies, some of the best tech people we knew into one room, telling them that how can we bring value to the small businesses? How can we bring these communities together, these people together to build something that goes on for like a couple of generations in terms of saying that the story started with a community and it made a community that we are proud of. So yeah, that's the beginning of Dime. That's super cool. Yeah. Um, what was the name of your first startup? The first startup was called Atwa. Atwa? Yeah. Like the restaurant you went to last night? No, <laughs> no, that was a, that's Artwa. Uh, this was A-T-T-W-A. And it essentially stood for one of the oldest Indian languages, which translated it into education for all. So art essentially says all, and wow was essentially education. So it was something which showed transparency with a lot of indigenous and tribal communities in India. And the entire focus was to make sure that it is very different from most government schemes, which is about free education and access to education to all. We wanted to make sure that there was open dialogue and the modules were designed to actually create more conversations than to just, you know, have a one way learning mechanism where the teacher is sharing knowledge. So we had the saying, learn manners first and then learn knowledge next. So we started teaching people about how they can go into their lifestyles and livelihoods and build friendships that come together 
And after that, we started actually sharing the knowledge base of like, you know, what is like maths, what is science, what is economics. And from there, we started building on their careers. So, yeah. That's amazing. And yeah. so um, was naturally, I don't know who joined first. Maybe Parsa. Parsa. Parsa it was like your first dialogue over a fruit, I hope. <laughs> oh, Parsa, why don't you tell the story of how we first met? It was way, way different than that. Uh, so Arnav and I weren't always the best of friends. Uh, so my background is in machine learning. I'm a published researcher by trade. Uh, but I met Arnav in my freshman year of university. Uh, oh, hold, hold, hold. I, got, I got to interrupt. <laughs> I have to interrupt. I'm a published researcher by trade. <laughs> I started a company when I was, I started a company, oh, we're going to get back there first, first, hold on, we're going to get back there, first started at six, 16, is first started, we, we should probably set context to how old you guys are now, Arnav, how old are you now? 23. 23, uh, Parsa, you're a published researcher by 20, man, okay, I'm going to say that, Parsa, back to you. Child prodigies over here, man. No, I don't, I don't know about that, I think we just work more than we should. Uh, but I met Arnav in first year, uh, and we were head to head in a lot of these business case comp and uh, technical hackathons. And I'd always, you know, he'd win one, I'd win one, uh, and they go back and forth. And after some time, we figured out that we should just stop trying to compete with each other and work together to solve this big problem. So during the pandemic, we saw that you know there's this great resignation. There was a whole uh, you know terrible thing that happened in the restaurant space and the social networking space. Uh, and, you know, the industry experts were turned on their heads. No one had really any idea what to do. And so we thought, you know, with the increasing labor costs, with the increasing uh, sort of set of problems in the world, can we apply some sort of uh, data analytics to this? And so from then on, we've been really focused on this uh, AI aspect and driving the restaurant sector and connecting people together uh, and bridging the gap in ways that are sort of novel and innovative uh, through data, through AI. And, uh, you know, now we're flourishing. So that's the investor pitch, but the real pitch is that. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> in the real story. Yeah, so. <laughs> First, it sounds so, like you started as an arch enemy, and then yeah. somehow yeah. started so. a coalition. I would love to watch this movie, actually. <laughs> like, this is the best ending ever. Yeah, <laughs> Coming so. Together to die. Honestly, like, the in that thing, like, Parsa is not wrong. Like, it, it is the truth that we started as uh, arch enemies and we were butting heads. But then. Like most college stories, it had a little bit of involvement of ladies in our lives. So we decided that if we are, you know, butting heads against each other, we are fighting for not just the prizes, but also for some similar loved interests. And we decided that if dying could be this concept, you know, where you meet people and you dine with them over a glass of wine, it would be a fun idea. So for both our mutual benefits, I guess Parsa uh, and I decided, like, maybe, you know, we can build up this platform that allows us to meet good people. And by people, it was getting past our date and using the skill set. Arnav's every good decision is how can you get closer to wife number three? <laughs> oh my goodness. This is like, so, so you have like the most authentic dating app. You're just like, I want to eat food anyway. I don't know if she has the same interests. The same <laughs> well, the best part is build a company which uses 30 million data points and, you know, works across five cities now. And, you know, it's fun. But, the real answer was like, yes, we were arch enemies. We came together because we saw that uh, our skill sets could actually benefit a community. But of course, while we did that, it was a lot of not just all working hard, not talk, boasting about published machine learning researchers or like serial entrepreneurs. We were also like best of friends in high, uh, like university. So then that process of like knowing someone, becoming friends with them, becoming brothers and now co-founders, it has been a journey. And through that, of course, like it was filled with a lot of food it was filled with a lot of wine and eventually came and dined. And I guess that's where Mani, you started helping us as well. <laughs> yeah. So Mani joined about a couple of months into dine and yeah. it has been a good experience. So what's the but Before we go to Mani, yeah. who won more business competitions? <laughs> 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 it sounds like it went back and forth, yeah, but there had to be yeah, like a clear winner it's by at least one goal. I would say that Arnab was a better pitcher, <laughs> uh, but he's also a bit, a bit better of a pitcher. So he got a little bit ahead of something. Okay. <laughs> So you're going to admit that he did maybe win a few more, but Arnav clearly needed a bunch of skills that you brought to the table to get that rolling. So Arnav's really good at presenting things that look cool and then don't work. And I have to come in. <laughs> I'm hearing architect plus engineer type dynamics. Beautiful yes. building and then yes. someone needs to yes. figure out how to build it. Yeah, that's exactly the dynamic we have. So yeah. for me, it's like I'm the dreamy boy. I, uh, 
uh, idealist and he's the hard eyed realist. So the fact is that whenever I have a vision, I'll say that, you know, we can present this in this way. I'll go all about talking about passion and bringing the ideas together and doing something cool and innovative. But Parsa is actually the realist. He tries to bring me down to reality, tells that these expectations can be met, these expectations can't be met. That keeps us both like in a balance, like the work hard, play hard nature we both have has been able to go across our team, building the culture as well, in terms of making sure that we are both innovative, scaling up rapidly, but at the same time, we are keeping our heads down. We're focused on the details, focused on the quality, the delivery, and making sure that, you know, we're building something which people would love using. So where did you join in, Manny? Yeah, so for me, Dime was always kind of like in my peripheral because I knew Parsa and I knew Arnav and I knew Eric uh, from, you know, a while ago back in university. And uh, it was always, I was just was very, very curious. They were making a ton of noise around campus. And it honestly it was just like my curiosity just led me to be like, hey, what are you guys doing? You know, and and the more and more I learned about it, the more and more I was intrigued and I realized what an incredible, incredible product that they have built. And after that, the more and more I learned about, you know, Parsa, Arna, Eric and the people involved, the more and more I started believing in the business. And after that, there was no, I wouldn't take no for an answer, really. I knew I had to get involved. And, you know, since then, it's, it's been amazing. You know, after about, you know, two months, um, I was leading the sales team. And, you know, the, the opportunity for growth was, you know, there for, for me to see. And, you know, the, the team, you know, luckily they trusted me. Um, fast forward six months later, and, you know, I'm halfway across the world, uh, halfway across the country and, you know, leading a team of my own here in Toronto. It's been a very, very beautiful time. <laughs> I can't complain at all. That's amazing. So a dying uh, my company was in your peripheral vision with an amazing team dying dynamic that you just had to try. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <that's fun. laughs> can't compete with that. Honestly. I guess based on what the image that you had in your periphery now being part of it, is it what you expected? Oh, it's more than I expected, honestly. Like, I, I honestly just saw it as like, wow, look at this student club who's raised a bunch of money. How do they do that? Like, it's pretty cool. And now I'm in it and it's a multi, you know, multi-city, multi-country business. That's just, you know, the sky's the limit. It's it's incredible. And I, and I see how much work these guys put in. You know, like they might come up here and be like, oh, I'm an ML researcher or whatever. It sounds easy. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I've seen the sleepless nights. I've seen the stresses. I've seen, you know, how much yeah. blood, sweat, tears these guys put, it, put in and, you know, really cool. motivated all of us to, to bring it bring it to where it is. But it goes without saying, like, it's the team. Like, I mean, Mani has also, like, you know, taken a big challenge off his own. So, like, I, I remember the day he was considering, you know, coming up to me and talking about Toronto. And he sits down with me, gets me a gin and tonic, he knows my drinks. <laughs> and he says that, you know, Arnav, you need to give me this opportunity and I want to lead this team. And I was like, we have no one there. We don't know the city. Like, there's no connection built. And in six months, he has established a full team of six people. And he has made connections with over 70-odd clients. We have over thousands of users in Toronto. And at the same time, full transparency. Full tra the only reason that Arnav said yes to the Toronto expansion is because Mani says he's going to get him a date in Toronto. So <laughs> <We're still waiting. laughs> I see a trend. I'm the, postponing that date a few months. Yeah, exactly. Like he, he always says that, you know, like even coming to Toronto this time, this week, like I, I was expecting something, but now my entire calendar is filled with meetings and <laughs> like different collaborations. Those deals, are the dates, like, man. Those are the dates. It's good. It's good. I, I, I'm enjoying it. I'm you never know what opportunities <laughs> Lots of meetings. Could be could be looking forward to that. Yeah. <laughs> so, I'll do yeah. my best for you. Do my best. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Um, well, I loved given that dine is all about food and drink, what is your favorite place that you've been able to have on the dine app that you've gone to? I know that you, you regularly are in all over Vancouver, all over Toronto, all the cities that you're in regularly, but um favorite restaurant that you've put on the dine app? And, and it can be at the same place or somewhere completely different. What's your favorite dish? Mm. I already know Parsons. But <laughs> I don't know everyone else's. You still got to say it. I think it's the same as what I think it is. But I'm just going to plug my favorite burger spot in Toronto. It's okay. called Burgers, Fries, and Forever. Okay. Have you been there? It's next. It's on uh, King Street. 
We haven't, but the next meetup. Let's do it. Let's do it. Yes. We're getting burgers. The, yeah. I, I'm burgers a big, big burger fan. Like, I've tried all of the burgers, I think, in Toronto. Not all of them, but I'm a big burger guy. Number one burger. Okay, so it's called Burgers, Fries, yes. and Forever. And Forever. Yes. yes. So we're going to try Burgers, Fries, and Forever. And if someone out there knows somewhere that's better, <laughs> like the best burger, fries, and forever in their mind, we want to hear it. Yeah. <laughs> and I want those recommendations, partially because I want to go try it out. And then I think Manny's going to want to talk to them because yeah. it sounds like his bar is set pretty high. What about the and what about there specifically? Is it the restaurant it vibe or is it the food? It's the food A and B. Like it's just the classic burger place. You know, I don't like like those burger places you go and it's like a mountain and I don't know they're doing some crazy stuff with it. Just like a classic American burger and it's just beautiful and like that's what you get. You know, you know so what is you're that getting. also your favorite dish by default or not really? Probably. Yeah, yeah. I, I can't, I can't, I can't, you know, look past the burger. I don't know why. Like it's smash burger? burger right? Yeah, smash burger. burger. Yeah, smash burger. Yeah, yeah. What do, you, what do you like on your burger? What do I like? My, I need bacon, cheese, um, a little bit of lettuce, and like any like house sauce that like goes well with the burger, I'm, I'm, I'm there. Got it. So yeah. you want their special like, yes. house yeah. sauce. Nothing else. No ketchup mustard. Really. No. Just, just whatever their house exactly. sauce is. Exactly. Yeah. Let me see what you got. Plus bacon. Okay, so burgers, fries, and forever must have a good house sauce as well. Oh, it's lovely. Yeah, it's amazing. Okay. Yeah, I'll take it. All right. We'll All go. Right. All right. <laughs> Who's next? Barso, you want to go for it? I mean, my spot is the most exclusive restaurant on the Dine app, <laughs> only because it's not on the production Dine app. It's only on the test version of Dine app. We call it Dine's Test Kitchen. And the address is my home address, which I won't be sharing on, on this podcast. <laughs> but essentially, whenever Arnav and Eric and the team are all hungry, they say, Parsa, cook us some food. <laughs> and they'll book a meetup in my house. Uh, and they'll come over and, you know, um, I'm, I'm a big Italian cooker. Uh, so I, I do a lot of that sort of stuff. But I recently bought one of these uh, Hot Ones hot sauce kits. So like, there's 11 different levels of spice. And I'm going to be making them do wings challenges. So you'll see those on our Instagram so, coming up soon. So fun fact about dying, we have this thing called chef challenge. So okay. what it essentially meant was it was a fun thing, which started between me, Parson and Eric. So <clears throat> one day while filling out a proper application form on a government portal, I misspelled chief executive officer as chef executive officer. So that's kind of this. <laughs> it seems way too appropriate. Oh, so, so the moment I did that and they got back to us on email. And this was like tagged with the entire company. And since then, this became a joke that, you know, the chefs, the three C positions would have a challenge to settle some big questions or big arguments. So in Dine, essentially, whenever there's a big argument or big decision getting made, it's over cooking and over the love of food. So we cook together and we decide a dish or a cuisine, which we don't specialize. So let's say Parsa is good at Italian, uh, but he's not good that great at Indian food. But we'll give him a chef challenge to cook Indian. And I'll give him a challenge. Like all of his Indian, but he can't handle Indian spice like that's that. True, that's, <laughs> true. that's true. That's very true. That's <laughs> true. So we do a chef challenge and we ask the team or someone else, like a completely neutral person, to come and actually try the food. And while they're trying the food, we actually also bring the points about discussion in terms of whose ideas are there, what are we trying to compromise, what are we trying to work out. And within that one hour of like just eating, we settle that debate. And of course, we do a poll on whose food was better. The loser essentially has to, you know, he gets a free bar tab that entire week. So we like he gets free food and free bar tab and the winner has to do all the dishes. I mean, he got the credit of, you know, being the winner and Parsa has been the winner. Or secretly, I let him win sometimes because I don't like doing dishes. And I get a bar tab. But yeah, like the chef challenge has been a fun thing and it is always in the dining test kitchen, which is like Parsa's house. Okay, but you also have to name a restaurant. Like I do, I, A, next time Paul and I are in Vancouver, I want to try out the dining test kitchen. Okay. Um, but, but but B, what it was like what is your favorite restaurant? Um, hopefully it's already on the dine app and and still your favorite your yeah. favorite meal or favorite dish. I mean, I think it's super cool that we can like discover places that we didn't know about if we didn't have the app in the first place. And when we, restaurants reach out to us saying, hey, I think it would be perfect for you, that's the sort of best fit. Uh, there's one place, I think I'll go with Monty's theme uh, of burger joints. It's called Juicy Joe Burger. Uh, this is a place, oh, Arnav, there, Arnav, Arnav's not, he knows it really well because uh, this is our go to late night uh, burger place because we always work until midnight and then when we want to go out, everywhere's closed except for Juicy Joe, which is up until 2 a.m. 
So big shout out to them and their mushroom blue cheeseburger. It, it saved my <laughs> life many times. <laughs> I've been there actually, Parsa. Fantastic burgers after late night in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. Is it equally Better good at like place. five o'clock in the afternoon, or is it like you must go honestly, here after midnight? <laughs> I don't think I've ever had a burger from there before ten o'clock. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So honestly, I've always had the burger <laughs> after like 12 o'clock midnight. So it actually tastes better. Like, I don't know, somehow like there's this charm <laughs> about having that midnight burger at Juicy Joe's. And like Parsa said, like these people, uh, it's not just the burger, the entire ambiance of that restaurant is just really great. And sometimes, you know, if you are really in a mood to try out something new, the chefs actually can make some fusion burgers as well. Because at midnight, there are not too many people coming in. So if you do happen to go to Juicy Joe's for all the people listening out here in Vancouver, maybe definitely ask the chef to, you know, spice it up or like have some fusion mixes because I've tried a butter chicken burger once there. And How was it? Honestly, not that great, but I appreciate the. <laughs> so don't get the butter chicken burger. Yeah. But the mushroom blue cheese burger is really good, and sometimes I also ask him to add bacon bites in it, so he can do that. So mushroom blue cheese with bacon bites is one of the best items I've had at uh, Juicy Joe's. But yes, Sparsa, like I think that's your favorite spot. Like I've seen you, like every time after eleven p.m. If I have to text Sparsa, he would be like, "Oh, let's go to Juicy Joe's," and I would be like, "Cool, let's do it." So it's fun. So is burgers your dish, or is there a different dish? Well, I'm not good at making burgers at home. It's not, I, I seek it when I go out. But like your favorite dish to eat, generally. I think, I think I've told you spaghetti carbonara. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, that's probably my favorite dish for sure. But last time, what was the place where we went for, for a meal? Di Pepe. Di Pepe. Di Pepe? Pepe. Oh, the, where we Di went Pepe. for lunch? Di Pepe. Yeah. And they, there's, I, I'm not normally a spaghetti fan, but what I like there is it was like a different noodle. I don't even know how to describe it. That's called lean on the Italian cuisine expert but i love like the the noodle and the pasta that they had that was a very good carbonara and i think you re-inspired me because i sort of always look over it on the menu <laughs> and i kind of like oh that feels heavy and I, I don't get it and then i had it again when we all ate together and i think you re-inspired me to start ordering carbonaras uh maybe customizing just swapping on the spaghetti bit which is maybe where i had like allergic reaction not an actual allergic reaction just like <laughs> spaghetti just wasn't my thing but parsa is the italian expert i'd say you've likely mastered pasta what about should we get you a homemade pizza maker like a wood fire pizza <laughs> oven for the, uh, pizza. Like I mean, the home kitchen i've definitely tried uh, i've had one situation where uh i put the pizza on the grill and then it sort of just went through <laughs> what? It came that was such a rookie mistake <laughs> <laughs> Since then, I've stuck to the past. <laughs> Fair enough. Oh, I did not know he made that mistake. That's hilarious. If we ever get to that point, maybe we'll get you like custom pizza boxes with the actual name of your home restaurant on there. Yeah, that'd be funny. Down the line. <laughs> Arna, what's what's yours? So I actually, I, I was taking the time to think because there's so many spots. I'm a big foodie, and uh, so there are two spots in Vancouver, uh, which I'm very, very like obsessed with. One of them is my favorite spot to go. And one of them has my favorite food. So the favorite spot to go is something, uh, it's a speakeasy. It is known as the Blind Tiger Dumplings. And if for the people listening here, you just have to go there and look into the dumplings menu and order the number seven. And after that, it's a magical experience, which essentially happens to be one of the best cocktail bars I've seen in over 20 odd countries I've visited. They get mixologists from New York, LA, Toronto flying in on every weekend. They have live music. And the best part is that while it's a really nice speakeasy with different cocktails, the food over there is a lot of authentic street food. So you get dumplings, you get some bao buns, you get uh, like fried chicken. And it gives you a vibe that you are in Shanghai because of the uh, like the theme, the aesthetics of it. But at the same time, the food is like Shanghai street food. So it brings you back there. And recently, the same group just opened another Indian-inspired speakeasy called Pagira. And we have been working with them as well. So if you go there, you will be inspired by this exp fusion experience of both Indian and um, Canadian cuisines in which there's a blend of how different cocktails are made. But the food, again, is a lot of street food. So it is kind of interesting for me to see, like, coming from India, where I have grown up, like, you know, trying the different blends of spices, food cultures, and diversity from north to south. They bring it all together 
in a speakeasy environment while making sure that the authentic taste is not lost. So it's one of my favorite spots to go. But my favorite dish that actually brings me to where I actually started dying is a place called Dosa Factory. It's in Kingsway, Vancouver. And for people who are listening, Dosa is essentially a huge Indian crepe in which it's stuffed with a lot of different potatoes. Uh, there could be different kinds of meats. Huge Indian crepe? Crepe, sorry, sorry, my accent is okay. So, crepe. Right? Um, I was so, gonna say, I don't know if I'm gonna order that. <laughs> no, no, no. Teach so, their own, teach their own. Yeah, so dosas, Let, let's just stick with the word dosas. So, dosa is my favorite dish, and this place, Dosa Factory, has 160 different types of dosas. It's open from 7 a.m. till 3 a.m. So, for all the early birds and the late night. Owls, it's the perfect spot. They have not changed that location in the last 20 years of operation. So when you go to that restaurant, it's the same way. It's a self-serve restaurant. So you have to pick your own cutlery, your water bottles, whatever you want. But at the same time, the food comes within five minutes of you ordering it. Wow. And it's under $10. And the amount of food you get for $10 is amazing. <laughs> so as a student, when I was discussing dine, uh, my initial discussions with a couple of founding members were over dosa. And it has been a dine culture that any new member who is coming towards the leadership position will have a discussion with me at Dosa Factory. So if any, if I, and I take everyone to Dosa Factory, starting from my best friends to uh, my leadership team, to my investors, because that shows how comfortable you are in a spot, which is not too fancy. It is just like, it's just proper food and service. So they just, you know, give you good food. They are very polite. And the tastes are very different because there's 160 different ways you can make it. So every time I go there, I try to, you know, experiment myself with a little bit of food. Barsa is right though. I am not very good with Indian spice tolerances. Even though I'm spice not... tolerance is crap. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, those are the two spots. So one of them is a speakeasy, my favorite spot to go. But my favorite food to have is dosas. So yeah, like more recommendations. I, I love it. Paula, what's yours? Mm -hmm. So, and is it in Toronto or Vancouver? I'm curious now. <laughs> this is like going to be like the, the biggest decider, yeah. decider of like where foodies should go. You guys started in BC, but Paul is also from Vancouver and now mm -hmm. in Toronto. So she's like actually experiencing the best of both worlds. I am. Yeah. I, honestly, it's a tough one. Um, but generally, my favorite restaurants are usually based on the experience of okay. being there. Mm -hmm. um, so one of my favorite places to go is Drawn Taberna on Queen Street. Oh, Toronto. Wow. Um, they do fantastic Eastern European food, but there's mm -hmm. always really amazing, like local live music. Mm -hmm. um, we, I've been there many times in the summer. My favorite memory actually was the first summer that I lived in Toronto. Um, I was coming from a Blue Jays game with about 15 people, which is a way too big of a party yeah. size to be trying to get a table without a reservation anywhere. Um, show up on a Saturday night at Drum Taberna with 15 people and say, is there any space that we can come and sit? And they say, they look at us and say, give me, give me a minute, we'll, we'll think of something. Um, they disappear and they come back and they're like, okay, follow us. And they take us through this back hallway, up the staircase. And it turns out that um, all of the staff, their break area was this actually gorgeous like rooftop deck um, mm -hmm. that they cleared out and made a table for us. So it wasn't actually open to the public, but just talk about like the most like welcoming space yeah. of like here you can have our space. Awesome. We'll it's set it up. Cool. Yeah. Really, really cool live music. I love live jazz mm -hmm. in particular and just the memory of that August night with like it's warm, balmy, gorgeous cocktails, really good kind of snack food um, and live music. Man, he's putting them on the tapata. Yeah, I saw, I saw, I saw. Like eyes in the corner. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. I was Artem take it down. Like, you know. And I've been there many times since. They're phenomenal in the summer because their patio is fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, and you'll just hear the music going all down Queen Street as you kind of walk by. Yeah. Um, so I'd say restaurant wise for the experience okay. would be them. Um, mm -hmm. Favorite meal I'm biased from being the west coast so anything seafood mm -hmm. um i would be thrilled um but I'm, we gotta pick one a seafood paella a really good yes. seafood paella. okay good choice yeah interesting what about you mike i had to think about this one um so i think close to here in burlington um there's a place really close to here called burrow mm -hmm. uh it is a taco restaurant i got introduced to it 
through one of my friends who's celiac. And so everything there is just by definition already gluten-free. Mm -hmm. So they use like corn tortillas. Their tacos are next level. Um, and they're really close, so I can get them very often. They're literally like a five minute drive from here. So it's called Burro. Uh, my favorite taco there, by the way, if you go to Burro, is the, the crispy Brussels sprout tacos. Ooh, that sounds good. So good. That sounds really good. Um, but in Toronto area, um, a place actually I hadn't been, everyone was sort of talking about it. A place called Bebos. Bebos uh, is fantastic. The vibe there. Really when we're talking about like ambiance and stuff, yeah, the, the vibe there is like super cool. And I was just looking up like my favorite favorite menu item there is the Wagyu Lemna Pide. And it is super good. It's sort of like a flatbread um, with like Wagyu beef on it. It's like so delicious. But none of those are my favorite dish. The thing that I love, my favorite dish, and I will try it everywhere across the world. Actually, you know, not. No, it's a <laughs> it is a pasta. It is a pasta. And I do have like a rating system. I've tried it all around the world in like Poland, Prague, Portugal, Croatia, Toronto, wherever is like a truffle. Pasta. Mm, I love classic. truffle. And so especially like if it's like a tru truffle and like gnocchi is like, but I, I, I don't discriminate. And so far, Probably my favorite truffle pasta has been at a place called Piano Piano. Yeah. Um, nice. They're like up there. There's a place that my first, like my number one, number one is a place. And I, I couldn't even tell you the name. Honestly, I don't remember the name of it. It was a place that we went to in, um, in Poland while on vacation this summer. And that, that's like my number one truffle pasta dish. That was my favorite. But in the top three, almost every time uh, has been the truffle pasta at Piano piano so also great wood fire pizza there too. They, they do have great wood fire pizza but I, and i thought at first it was like i went uh to piano piano for the first time for a wedding and the wedding one of like you could order anything off like their their fixed menu and i ordered the truffle pasta so at first i thought it was like okay it was like it was weddings so was part of the vibe had a couple of drinks so i thought it was that so then i tried it again and it's it's hit every time so it, it slaps as they say as they say as they say Cool. Well, I think now we know what everyone likes to eat. I'm stuck. I'm, hungry. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm so hungry. I'm like, I'm like, I need breakfast. Oh, yeah, man, so all we have is coffee and water. Um, I, let's look a little bit more about dying. Like, we beat around the bush. People at this point definitely know what's about food and, and getting our updates. Um, <laughs> but let's let's cross the chasm into learning about the, the startup and the way we do that. Arna, pitch, your please. best pitch, please. <laughs> Awesome. Well, so Dang is a machine learning based SaaS company in, which is focused in the restaurant industry. We provide insights to restaurants to improve the predictions in terms of revenue forecasting, pricing analysis, inventory management, um, customer sentiment analysis, and much more. We currently operate with over 700 clients across five cities of Toronto, Vancouver, Edmonton, Calgary, Seattle. And it's for everyone, starting from mom and pop shops, your local caf cafes in your neighborhood, to even big chains like well, Starbucks, who are using our software to making a lot of different recommendation patterns. The entire problem started during the pandemic. Like I mentioned, Parsa and I were butting heads about different competitions and not getting enough dates. But we saw that during the pandemic, the entire restaurant industry was quite badly impacted. There was a loss of staff, loss of jobs, revenue, and people went towards bankruptcy. And when every other tech company wanted to focus in terms of deliveries and focusing on POS systems for payment gateways, we saw what if we actually help the restaurants scale their operations, getting people back in, providing that hospitable experience of enjoying a meal. In the last you know, five minutes, we have been hearing people talk about the best spots in town. The entire purpose is the experience you get in a restaurant, the vibes you get from it. And that you know appeals to you calling the restaurant maybe a home. And we wanted to make sure that restaurant owners and managers get the same feeling when they're servicing their best loyal clients, but also when a new client walks into the same door. So using our analytics feature, we have allowed restaurants to not only manage their staffing and inventory management, but also focus on their pricing recommendations, focusing on their different strategies and entering the market. And while we did that, we thought of you know making this a little bit fun. So people must have heard it's about people, food, communities. So in order to do that, we thought a business is like a magic trick. When everybody considers that the magic is happening up front, it's actually the magician's assistants in the back end who are actually getting the job done. 
So dying to the entire world is known as a foodies app. We host a B2C mobile app with over 20,000 users across these five cities who go around town exploring the best spots, having the best experiences through our quests and engaging chat features. But while they're trying to find these, they're also building a data set and a data pipeline. This allows us to become a data company that provides the insights towards these restaurants, helping them scale their operations. So towards everyone, it's just a foodies app, but the real business is on scaling the restaurants and supporting them by providing data-driven decisions that can allow them to scale their community they're part of. And local businesses really appreciate it because every restaurant is a testament to a local economy's success. If people are spending in a restaurant, it showcases that the community is thriving. People are liking going out. The livelihood is there. The lifestyle is there. And that goes on to say that we need to enjoy good food, good people. And the concept was simple. Everyone loves food. Food connects people. And we just made it effortless, bringing the two worlds together, sharing our culture, sharing our love for food, and making sure that people can enjoy this experience while you're getting to know another person. And that's dying. That's awesome. Do you walk through? I'm going to cry. Oh, of course not. <laughs> That's just because you were up so early. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone knows uh, Parsa on the West Coast was up for six o'clock this morning. So thank you, Parsa, for joining us. Yep. Um, <laughs> I love to know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd love to actually kind of jump a little bit more into you spoke about the B two B and the B two C side of things. Yeah. For some of the listeners um, that are maybe interested in, mm -hmm. in Dine and actually using it, can you walk through what that's like on, on the consumer side? Of Absolutely. App? So first of all, shameless plug, download the Dine app to get the best <laughs> experience. It's available on both app, the App Store as well as the Google Play Store. There we go. Mm -hmm. So I already see Mike on the app. So the app allows people to establish their core interests as well as based on their regions, their preferences, we start recommending them different spots. These restaurants can vary from mom and pop shops to some scale-ups like local diners, which have a couple of locations, to even enterprise clients like Starbucks, Earl's, Joy's, Cactus, which is across the country. Uh, people can meet new people, they can meet their new friends, and while they're using the app, they have a reward system. It's like air miles or hotel points, where you keep earning points, and the best part about dining is that you can redeem it across anywhere you want. So it might happen that you might enjoy your morning Starbucks coffee five days in a row, and automatically by Saturday you have enough points to go to Joey's or Cactus to get a free pasta, or maybe truffle pasta, like Mike says. So, we created this entire platform based on one thing that the community comes together in this engagement. So the best feature of Dine on the mobile app is the quest feature. This is a machine learning feature which caters different challenges for you to find different hidden gems of the city. It allows people to hop different places, try different food, different cuisines, while of course it takes into their tastes and preferences. Uh, we know that, you know, uh, Michael here likes some Italian food and some pastas. It might, the app might send him on a food crawl to try different Italian spots and also maybe a dessert place or two towards the end of the night while making sure that he is staying within his community and locality so he doesn't have to travel too much. I mean, nobody wants to travel from Burlington to downtown Toronto <laughs> on a Thursday when the traffic is peak. But at the same time, the app makes sure that you are around your close ones. So whenever you try some new spots and you're trying some, uh, you know, really good experiences, your friends get updated about it as well. That, you know, let's say Paula tried this amazing burger joint and she says that it's the best in Toronto. So automatically your friends get to hear about it. And maybe Mike gets jealous and finally decides to drive down from Burlington towards downtown Toronto to try that spot. And when he does that, he earns points, you earn point, everyone is happy. And this happens across different cities as well. So starting from students, working professionals, families, we have different sets of users who use Dine not only to bring people together, but also have this experience of trying new things, getting out there, being a little, you know, adventurous and seeing what the food world can offer. And of course, that creates this one whole community we are really proud of. And that goes to thank all our users, by the way. So if you are the 20,000 number one user, that will be my pleasure to host you in one of my favorite spots as well. So, so talk me through, like, I, I've got the app open yeah. right now. <clears throat> And the general person would start by going to Quest, going to meetups. Yeah. And uh, what I want to understand a little bit is, as a, as a consumer user of the app, um, when you're saying going to these places, like, do I have to open the app and do something at those places? Should I create a meetup? Should oh. I start by picking a restaurant? Like, how would someone start to use it when I, when I kind of first open it up? What's the best first experience to try out uh, to get the most value out of the Dine app? Tech boy, you're up. 
<laughs> give, give me and the it really depends on It really depends on sort of uh, what kind of uh, cadence using the app. And meetups are great for people who already have their sort of friend circles established and their best uh, and favorite spots already known. It just makes it easier to go, go to those places and get rewards for them. So those people who are sort of, uh, you know, veterans in their city and know all the hidden gems, they go straight to the meetups. But people who are maybe new to the city, maybe they're a little bit younger, maybe they don't have that uh, strong network, maybe they're looking to make some friends, looking to find some new places. They go to our quest feature as the first stop and say, what's the sort of, uh, you know, best place that fits me and my interests? And they find those like-minded individuals along those quests and scavenger hunts and adventures they go on. Uh, that allow them to sort of make those connections and find those places that become their, you know, their Tuesday hangout spots or their Sunday brunch places. And so it really depends on what market we're, we're trying to service. And we, we're, we've been able to, you know, have that, uh, you know, that daily active cadence, that monthly active cadence, depending on uh, the different types of users we have. And, you know, we're looking to always help, you know, more types of users so, find their, their foodie love. And at this point, I guess I can give a sneak peek to something which is coming up with Dine this month. So even if you're not a very tech savvy person who doesn't like to, you know, have hundreds of apps on their phone, Dine can still be one of the things which helps you. Uh, Dine is building this new entire feature where no matter which restaurant or where you go in which city, the moment your name or your phone number is associated with your profile, you automatically just walk into a restaurant and, you know, just give down your phone number and your name and it will automatically pull up what kind of a foodie you are, what cuisines do you like, what is your preference in terms of drinks. And if you are a loyal customer of a certain place, let's say Paula over here is a tier four customer and she loves to go to the same spot again and again, like a couple of times a month, she will automatically be allowed to skip the lines. She will be given her favorite table by the window with a glass of wine automatically within a couple of minutes. And we are doing this without the app even. So we always say, regardless of what, there are foodies everywhere. And food connects people. So we're trying to build this entire feature regardless of the app. People can use Dine as a method to walk into any store, any place, get the same experience. Because for Dine, it's all about making sure that they get the best experience inside the restaurant. And restaurant owners have access to our platform, which provides them the insights on which customers are working in. So whether you're a foodie who is tech savvy to use the app, try some new spots, or if it's just your you know local neighborhood Italian diner, which you keep on going in. That is the every step of the way. So come dine with us. I'd love to know because I'm I'm actually creating my account right now. Yeah. As you're speaking, I just downloaded the app. Yeah. Um. Why? I, I'd love to learn more about kind of the the questions. It's learning a little bit more about me about movies, TV, music, pets. Um. I love that it's asking, um, yeah. all these questions. How how does that kind of inform my my dine experience? So it's uh, so like I mentioned earlier. Yeah, I'm not- you can't ask these kinds of questions. It's it's too too technical for these kinds of these uh, podcasts. Well, you're a tech guy. Go for it. Give us the simple. Give, keep it simple. Let's see. Essentially, we look at uh, all your different interests and sort of usage patterns outside of the app, integrating your social media and those preferences there, but also seeing what people in your community and your network are also uh, you know meeting up at where they're going to, what their interests are, and finding those small communities uh, that are most similar to you uh, and recommending you people from them in the networks of restaurants that they go to as those sort of first points. And then, you know, same, same way how you have LinkedIn, which has people you may know, we have restaurants you may know, we have, we have quests you may know, we have many different events that you may know about. And that sort of helps to build that organic uh, network from this foodie lens. Very cool. So when you guys think about customers, um, actually maybe like, when you think about what problem you're solving, uh, if we dial back to what you were saying, the, the original problem statement revolves around helping restaurants uh, thrive. Yes. And so um, are they, I guess, in any double-sided marketplace, you still have to pick one place to start. Do you start with the end user of the app or the restaurant uh, to, to get the ball rolling? And I think I kind of know the answer based on what Manny is here in Toronto doing, but to, to make the app successful and to, to make a market successful, do you start with the restaurants or do you start with the users of the app? So it's like a catch-22 situation. It's the chicken and the egg problem, which yeah. many, many companies have seen. For us, it was first delivering our value propositions towards our customers and clients, that was restaurants. We first tried to make sure that they are ready and capable of servicing their customers. 
And if we are servicing our customers and empowering them to service their customers, we are indirectly getting towards the B2C vertical. So it's a B2B2C strategy, which we developed. And our team is more focused in terms of building good relations with these spots, because when we are giving them recommendations, when the machine learning algorithm is giving a recommendation, they are making some kind of a decision. That decision not only impacts their business, but also impacts the hundreds of customers which will be walking through that door. So we want to make sure that our relationships with those clients are secure. Once we are able to secure that relationship, we have the trust. We are able to make the experience in that restaurant better. And once the experience gets better, when the people are coming in, they enjoy a good time. When they enjoy a good time, the trust and the relationship of that customer with that restaurant becomes better. And indirectly, the customer's dining experience becomes better with dining. And that's when we focus in terms of focusing on our activations on the B2C communities, starting from 2,525 brunch series to dining festivals to networking events, yacht parties, and a lot more events which can bring people together, have good food and vibes. So we are calling it wine and dine, which actually is a method of us making sure that our users feel that they are getting engaged. And of course, while all of this is happening, our users can still get access to thousands of different coupons every day, can get more than you know hundreds of different recommendations on places they should try out and get the best dining experience. But in terms of establishing the business model and how we scaled across these five cities, it was first building the relationships and the trust with our clients, ensuring that they are ready to serve their customers. Because if we empower them to serve their customers, our users feel that they're getting the best dining experience when they walk in. So whether they have the app or not, there's dying for everyone in this place. That makes sense. And so Manny, you've been here in Toronto for how long kind of setting the foundation? Because everything started in, in Vancouver. And so, uh, and then you expanded to Edmonton, you said was another yeah. market. That was, was that the secondary market? Yes. So we started from Vancouver to Edmonton, to Calgary, yeah. with Seattle, and now in Toronto. Yeah. So you're in Toronto. Uh, yeah. How long have you been kind of setting the foundation for the market here in Toronto? And yeah. how's that going? Yeah, so uh, I moved out here in uh, in September, and you know immediately I looked. You know our bread and butter in terms of uh, from the B two C angle is always students, and the reason is because students are broke and hungry, and so it kind of makes sense to go after people, you know, to feed them and help them save money, right? So immediately I started, um, you know, uh, creating contacts in all the universities that we have here in Toronto, um, York University, uh, U of T, TMU. We're looking at Waterloo next, um, and from there, you know, I've, we've we've really started to build a community like like there is in Vancouver around the idea of you know sharing time over food, um, and and you know really enjoying that experience of, of restaurant going as as we always have, um, and obviously you know from there we can then shift that focus onto the restaurant side, where you know. As much as you know, it is about like the customer experience and enjoying that. Like we we are helping people improve their livelihoods, and I think that's like a, a, a big thing that you know draw drew me in in the first place as well. Is that you know during the pandemic we saw people lose their lives over over something like this, right? You know they lost everything. A restaurant goes downhill, they lose everything, and we we I saw the potential of stopping that from ever happening again while helping these people, you know, really thrive in their businesses and, you know, all the while, you know, keeping everybody else happy in terms of, you know, their restaurant going experience. So since then, you know, it's been about, you know, reaching out to those clients that may need the help as well as, you know, obviously dealing with the bigger, the bigger brands as well. Of course, you know, it's, it's only natural, but, uh, but for me, that's, that's been a, it's been a key factor as well, helping those smaller businesses scale to, to their potential. And you definitely have, just from seeing Dine's growth, it's been exponential. We were just talking about this yesterday in the last couple of months in Toronto and across mm -hmm. Canada. I'd love to know, like, growing a business, I can imagine, is a huge amount of work. Like, was what were some of the biggest challenges you found over, I guess, the last year or so? And what are you most proud of that the business has uh, been successful in achieving? The biggest challenge is getting past that date. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah going back to the biggest challenge i guess uh, when dine started uh my team presently is even is all of us are under 25 years of age and most of us are still in university graduating soon so the biggest challenge was convincing both our professors investors shareholders that we can build a business while in school and it is not the first time someone is doing it we have seen unicorns we have seen billionaires who started their lives 
when they were 18 or 19. And I'm pretty sure there are more successful people even younger than me these days. The fact about managing time, managing responsibilities while making sure that you're giving the commitment, the passion and the dedication it needs was something all of us struggled. And it's not just me as a founder or even like money as one of the leadership members. All of us had to go through this process of coming together and understanding what each one of us does. But the best success also came with that. The entire growth of Dine, like I was talking about it yesterday in a couple of events that January 2022, we had 3,000 users and 20 locations. January 2023, we have 20,000 users and 700 locations. The growth of 12 months is exponential. We have made at least 20 times revenue growth as well. It has been possible because of the team. This team is the driving force behind Dine. It's not the vision. It's not the techie boy with machine learning research papers. It's the team which drives each day to do something they're passionate for. And the best part about my team is that they are hungry. They love to dine out, which means that they love working in a different dynamic, which allows them to work across cultures, diversities, time zones. So there's no fixed working hours for dine. Like we sometimes have our meetings in boardrooms and we also enjoy doing meetings in sports bars and pubs while sitting around the table and discussing new ideas. The team's success in terms of managing their commitments, their passion, their interests, and also focusing on the professional growth opportunities, taking you know, risks and challenges in terms of, you know, like I said with money, I'm super impressed because he took a challenge that he would do something nobody in the team did. Could go move out to a completely new city with zero resources, zero help. Yes, he had my support and Parsa's support, but the fact is that coming to a new city when no one knows him, establishing a brand, setting up shop, and now building relations, which is helping us scale quickly, that was a risk he took. And this risk in terms of managing all this responsibility, while it was a challenge for some of us about six or seven months ago as students, is now our biggest strength, that we are able to manage this. And that goes on to showcase towards our clientele as well, that we are able to service different types of people, starting from the mom and pop shops who like sitting down with me personally, to discussing an hours and hours on what strategies they should do, to the big scale-ups and the enterprise clients who will not even spare 15 minutes on a phone call, but make millions of dollars of decisions, we have built Dine to be serviceable for all. And that is what gave us the success and came out to be our biggest threat. So we had the saying in our team, uh, every crisis is an opportunity in disguise, which means that no matter how many challenges we have hit as students, we have always come across. And I, I guess that's the best part of you know being young, agile, and also adaptable, that we are vulnerable towards these things. But the vulnerability makes us stronger as a team. It makes us more powerful, unites us. And of course, there's food on the table, so why won't we come around and you know, have some good bites and get some drinks? Well, the good news is we've got Manny's back now. He's got, he knows some people now in the, in the GTA. Absolutely. He's got a downtown foodie. If he ever wants to come expand out to the suburbs, I've got you. Absolutely. I'll let you know all the cool spots in Burlington, I'm ready for Ontario. I'm ready for Burlington. Oh, boy. The team just sounds dynamic. Yeah. Very. Yeah. It rubs off on you. Yes. <laughs> What uh, are, are there competitors in this in this space? Like, uh, is is like Touch Bistro or uh, ritual, uh, ritual? Like, are they competitors? Complementary? Like, how does how does that work for, for you? So that's actually the smart part about Dine. So while many people have tried building an app for foodies, nobody focused on the restaurant side, and the folks who are on the restaurant side are too busy focusing on deliveries and payment gateways. So we decided on bridging that gap. So currently, Dine has built partnerships with over seven different POS companies, including Touch Bistro, Lunchbox, uh, Square, and a lot more other different tech companies, in which we are telling them that, hey, we will use your software as a POS terminal, and we'll build your business if you use Dine as well. So everybody gets to Dine with us. And at the same time, on the B2C side, we are providing users a value in terms of not just giving them free coupons and experience, but we're building that loyalty factor that when they go into the restaurant, they get a better experience. And that is what incentivizes users, but monetizes restaurants. And this strategy has been unique in our good market thing. And that is what led to the growth as well. Parsa, did I miss out anything? Yeah, I mean, you got all the points. Essentially, we centralize all these different integrations for these restaurants. So we act as this really big customer data platform and analytics engine. And of course, the users get the benefit of having all the different restaurants, which each have their own loyalty systems, all in one app, all you know, uh, transferring across each other so they can redeem, redeem points in one place and earn points at the next place. I, I love the, the strategy on partner versus compete. Um, 
And so in that regard, I, I noticed when signing up for the app a long time ago and, and using it, and Paul will probably just know this now, it's free for users. If anything, as a, as a consumer user of the app, yeah. you're only benefiting from also like you're paying nothing and you're getting coupons, deals, points that you can use towards things. So who, where do you guys make money? Is this just like a charity? <laughs> I know, I know you're super into like philanthropy, but for every where, date I get on that, he gives me a ten thousand dollar check. That's that's my. <laughs> okay, I like it. So yeah, where, where in this cycle do you make make your money? So Dine's entire business model is focused on the restaurants. We focus on providing restaurants the entire data set to make decisions. And this makes Dine a data company. And as most data companies, we have a SaaS model, which means that restaurants pay us a monthly fee in terms of scaling up their operations. And they also get a choice of choosing what they want to do. So it's like buying a car. When you're buying a car, you pay a base fee, but at the same time, you can have all the add-ons, the extra rims, the colors, the spoilers, and that allows you to get a better experience. So with Dine, the basic tier just starts at 70 bucks a month, something which is pretty much negligible for a restaurant. It's like one check sir one small table check. And while they get on the platform for 70 bucks a month, they can get access to our machine learning features, the revenue forecasting, the expansion strategies for another couple of hundred dollars. And that gives them the best experience based on what their business needs. And this has allowed Dine to build a trust as well as a huge retention on our business model. So in our entire operations, we have had a retention of over 76%. Wow. And at the same time, in terms of building new clientele, our sales funnel is overflowing. So we have a 450% sales funnel right now with a conversion of 92% from that sales funnel, Impressive. which allows us to get customers at a low price point, but give them more better experiences as they add on different services. So the SaaS revenue model is what focuses on dying, providing the value experience to the restaurants. And in our entire you know growth strategy we don't want to charge users because as a student i've been broke and i've not been getting dates thanks to parsa so i've decided that the app will be free and the app will provide the best experience because we want to make sure that when someone is passionate about food they should not be paying for an app they should be paying for that experience and that means that they should be going to good restaurants trying the best food getting the best experience and if the restaurant makes good money we also make money so we want to make sure that you guys have the best experience in getting out there enjoying while you're dining out with us. I love Amazing. it. So looking forward, yeah. um, the next six to 12 months as the business begins to scale and grow, um, what matters? What's important? What tools have you been using to, to grow and kind of where's your head at on what's next in the, in the scale strategy? Awesome. I mean, my biggest goal in the next six months is to go on a meetup with Taylor Swift, but you know, that's sort of a... <laughs> That now real uh, place. <laughs> That's Parson's goal. That's Diane's goal. <laughs> Diane's goal. I mean, you know, I can speak to it from the tech side for for, uh, for sure. You know, there's always an aspect of trying to get bigger and, and better insights and having, you know, using the the, the data in, in in wiser ways. And so, you know, we've been lucky enough to work with with Mike and Azure in in growing our <clears throat> our ML infrastructure into these new sort of. Um, cutting edge algorithms to help with stuff like, you know, where are you going to put your next location as a restaurant? Uh, how can I better understand uh, each of my customers within different demographic segments? And, um, you know, can we even expand this to different verticals from rest from the hospitality industry, from tourism, from events, and sort of looking into uh, not just, you know, multi-city expansion, but cross vertical expansion as well. And from a business standpoint, business is about people. It's about bringing people and cultures together. So, our big vision for the next 12, bu uh, 12 months is to have nine in every pocket across North America. It's an ambitious strategy, but at the same time, we want to make sure that everyone using this app gets the same value. Whether you are in a small city or whether you're in a large you know, corporate town, you have the same experience of enjoying the best meals and coming together with the people you love. While we are doing so, we want to drive decisions based with data. So the data-driven decision comes from Parcel's point about building better algorithms with precise information and telling them to transfer into it. If your business is not doing well, you should be aware of it. You should not be walking towards bankruptcy when the pandemic hit and saying that, oh my goodness, I'm going to shut down my businesses and cut down on jobs. You should be prepared to take that hit. If your business is doing better, you should know where exactly you can expand. Should you be expanding into Miami? Should you be going global and going towards the European market? We want to make sure that these decisions are precise and are allowing people to make some kind of new 
you know, ventures for themselves in the business world. And while we are doing so, of course, the people who are coming together due to this initiative creates more jobs, more employment, creates more good experiences and happiness around our entire community. So everything about our vision is to make people fall in love with food once again. We want to bring people over food and people like food in general. So if someone is not a foodie, I don't know what they do. So I, li I like to say the concept <laughs> is simple always. People like food, food connects people. Let's bring them together and make it effortless. What are, um, if people are listening right now and they want to help, what's sort of like your, your next set of help needed where people can help? I guess one of the things will be download the Dine app and start using it. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll, we'll make sure to link that. But are there any other ways that people can help or, you know, support? send us your favorite restaurants? Okay. Yeah. And is there, there a, is there one a, on the app? Is there a formal way to, to do that? Um, absolutely. You can, so. you can, you know, follow us on all our social channels, starting from Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook. We are always available to take recommendations. And on the Dine app, there's going to be a new feature which allows you to drop a location, a pin, about your favorite restaurants. And it's our challenge to get that restaurant signed up within 30 days so that you can have the best dining experience across your own neighborhood. So we will be building that feature in the next 90 days and we'll be allowing uh, entire set of <laughs> I see Marissa's face. She's like, I didn't even know about that feature yet. <laughs> but Marissa, now I've said it. It's a promise. So, you know, you're going to dine with me once I'm back in Vancouver. It's just like the hackathon. You say something when you got to build it. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the best vision. So if people want to help us, we need recommendation for restaurants. So uh, download the Dine app. And while you're at it, explore some new spots and tell us about your favorite spot, whether it's on our socials or through the dine app, we'll make sure that we get that spot around you so you can get the best dining experience. And for people, youngsters listening to it, if you're interested in joining the team, joining this movement, do reach out to me personally. I think I'll let Mike uh, share my yeah, we'll, we'll information. Add, whatever out. is going to be most convenient. Yeah. So I think in the, in the show notes, we'll definitely include something around how to, how to download it sounds like there'll be recommendations. We'll probably try to help Manny out here in his yeah. expansion and conquering of the Toronto region <laughs> to make sure anybody that has either uh, recommended restaurants or even connections into great restaurants. Yeah. Uh, and, and I can already think of amazing people that, that might be interested in driving some introductions in the, in the Toronto market and then hiring uh, across all markets. Are you a distributed team? Is there a specific area where, where you're hiring um, today? Yes. I mean, right now, if you're anywhere across Canada or in the okay. West Coast of the U.S., as well as we're actually doing an East Coast expansion in the next uh, seven to nine months. So uh, sort of those areas are the biggest uh, points of interest. What, what type of roles are you guys looking for? Like, what type of people are you, do you need? The first criteria is they need to be foodies. Okay. They need to love food. And they, step one. So uh, it's like step one of like getting a job with Dai and step on a scale. Go <laughs> <laughs> your receipts at five different restaurants and then you can yeah. apply to the job. Because when I step on a scale, you'll know I'm a foodie. <laughs> <laughs> no, so uh, we're hiring across Canada. And at the same time, on the East Coast, we're looking for both technical and non-technical positions. The tech team is rapidly hiring in terms of finding engineers who are passionate about building an app while making sure that they are providing insights and data-driven decisions. So we're looking for back-end engineers, we're looking for front-end engineers, full-stack developers, uh, QA, QC folks, and at the same time, the business units are always looking for marketing reps. So we are making sure that our marketing team is scaling up. It requires both kinds, B2B marketing for building a better brand management strategy and PR campaigns, B2C team, which is more focused on activation events and actually engaging with people. We have everyone from, you know, recent grads to even high school students providing them opportunities to grow because we don't feel like, you know, food discriminates anyone. So if you're a foodie, that's the biggest criteria you can apply with us. You need to be passionate. You need to be excited about exploring spots and meeting new people. So be vulnerable to change. Get ready to try some good food and you get to dine with us. I love it. Actually, just we're starting to come to a couple things of wrap, but part of what I maybe there's a value in adding even like how we all know each other. So at today's podcast, you can probably tell the dynamic has been amazing. We've been engaging with Dive for, for quite some time. Um, I don't know if you guys want to talk about how we all met and Paula, <laughs> how we all got, why Paula is the co-host, how this all kind of came together. Um, and so how, how we're working on this on this vision of expansion together. I think it all started with the bow tie. So. Oh, yeah, it's, uh, I've been, I've been <laughs> but we did mention it was about bow ties in Azure. So uh, as a young startup, we have been always looking for mentorship and looking for partners which can collaborate with us. 
And this year, we had an opportunity of uh, meeting Microsoft's team during the fall. And that's how we came across this program called the Founders Up program, in which our experience has been amazing. It has been dynamically fabulous. And we have been working with their teams in terms of setting up our entire technical backing structure with Azure. Through Founders Up, we got mentorship access across business and tech units. We were able to reframe our go-to-market strategy, have our expansion growth. And while all of that was going on, Parsa's team focused on actually delivering on the technical milestones. We started working with the Microsoft Teams and moving towards the Microsoft Partner Network, in which now Dian is essentially on Azure. I can successfully say the migration was completed and it has been tested across our different clientels in which we're building a scalable platform, which is secure, which is robust and is that is providing the same experience across our clients across the world now. And while we build this relationship with Microsoft, we also came to dine with them. So there has been multiple meetings in which we have had a chance of meeting Paula, Mike, across a couple of food meals across in the table. And one of the such meals which actually got us together was the Bota incident. Mike and Paula were visiting Vancouver for one of their events and the dining team had the pleasure of hosting them. So we went to this Italian spot where it again comes back towards the spaghettis, the truffle uh, pastas, and we had a chance of getting to know each other. In that incident, I guess, to the listeners out here, Mike, who doesn't like wearing bow ties, is now a vivid fan of bow ties. He's a huge bow tie fan now. now. Yeah, so had Parsa give offer his bow tie for the formal event that was happening, formal reception that was happening that evening. And uh, that started this unique journey in which we both develop a friendship, a mentorship, and people we can, you know, refer across the country. So whenever I'm in Toronto, it becomes a ritual now, I guess, to visit these two guys. And over there in Vancouver, we love to dine with them. So yeah, it has been something fun. And I guess this goes back to what I mentioned. It's quite simple. Food brings people together. And we started with this vision that through dine, we are able to bring people together whether it's professionals across the country with different backgrounds, different experiences, or it's even you know, a couple of university kids trying to find dates like me and Farsa. <laughs> There's something for everyone in dying. I love it. Well, Paula, thank you for setting up the first meal. They yes. got me to meet this team <laughs> where Farsa hooked me up with a bow tie, which made me look super skinny. <laughs> I'm wondering, like, you know, if, if I give like Joe Rogan a bow tie, I'm going to be on that podcast too. Like, if you're just smiling, <laughs> You might be onto something, but now I'm a bow tie <laughs> fan. And then obviously a shout out to, to anyone that is, uh, you know, a startup, whether you're just writing your idea on a napkin or you're massively scaling up, I think we'll connect uh, a link for you to connect with Paula, um, who leads everything around Founders Hub and startups at, at Microsoft, a little shout out. Um, what, what I love to do in the end of this podcast, and so... Uh, Manny, Arnav, Parsa, you guys are going to have to select who you think is going to be the best at this. Um, but saying Pick Please podcast really fast back to back is actually quite tough. And so what we do at the end of every episode is we get someone, usually it's the founder, but in this case, you guys can pick who. And we see how many times they can say Pitch Please podcast fast without tripping up. What's the record? Uh, so the other fun thing I do is I never tell anyone what the number is. So they have to listen to all the other podcasts or a competitive person to see what the tally is. That's evil. It's good, right? It's like the, the, very integrated. So uh, whoever wants to go, you just let me know who it's going to be. You could have some water, make sure you're not too parched. Uh, and, then, and then we'll do a countdown. And you can start whenever you want. I'm excited. I'm, I'm down to bully Parso. All right, Parsa. Yeah. <laughs> all, right. all eyes on the all eyes on the TV. Parsa, please pitch. Okay, so I'm saying pitch, please podcast, 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 uh, I can tell you, you may not be the best, but you're also not the worst. <laughs> Where you rank, you will have to have to see. Um, team, thank you so much for coming by today. I, I love the dynamic of having some of these also be here in person. So thank you so much for making the time. And Paula, thanks for being an amazing co-host. I want to do so many more of these with co-hosts. It's like such a better dynamic. Anything that anyone wants to add uh, before we before we close out?
download the dying app. <laughs> oh, wow, there's so many things. Download the dying app. <laughs> No, this is fantastic. Honestly, it's been a privilege watching Dine grow over the last year, really. Um, so thank you um, for letting us be part of the journey. And actually, as part of the podcast, I'd love to ask who, what other startups do you think we should talk to next? Dressing. So, and you can connect us after, but now they're going to get some free airtime on the <laughs> who, who do you want to spotlight? So there's this startup based out in New York. Okay. Uh, they are scale up as well. It's called Hubly. And their founders have been actually mentoring me as well. So they are into fintech, and that's all I'm going to say because I guess it's their show to talk about. Okay, okay. Can I plug another yeah, one? Yeah, yeah, plug another one. Juna Health, also uh, also based out of yeah. New York. They've been mentoring us as well. Uh, okay. They are about um, STI testing, oh, and okay. they're doing a great job. Yeah. Any Canadian startups? Oh, um, I want to, I, like, we're all Canadian. I really want to bring the vibe back to the Canadian startup scene as well. I, any day. I see parts that like he's on edge. He knows like all these people. I have had this. I mean, my 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 go to is always this uh, nine second news bite app. It's called Vol. They're not well, they're, uh, Canadian. They're, they're, no, they're they're Indian. They're they're not. Yeah, no, I'm aware. <laughs> so yeah, but, but I have a Canadian startup. Okay, and okay. I'm just gonna say the name. Yeah, it's gonna be up to you guys to figure out. Okay, it's called Seco.ai. They okay. are building something fun, so you guys might check them out. Okay, seco.ai. All right, we're going to check out all these. I love it. Yeah. We're also probably going to try to link up a couple other Vancouver ones that Paula, Paula knows soon. Um, everyone, thank you so much for coming by. Yeah. Uh, thank you for braving the drive this morning. Hopefully the traffic <laughs> wasn't too bad. Hopefully the coffee and water were good. We were going to do some mimosas, but I forgot to pick up. <laughs> maybe on the next one. It'll give you a reason to come back. Yeah. Carson's going to have to join on the next one. We'll go get some truffle pasta. We'll drag him out here. We'll drag him out here. Yeah, yeah, we'll do it. Yeah. Sweet. All right. Thank you, everybody, for Thank tuning you. in again to the Pitch Please podcast. Uh, catch you all on the next episode. Thanks.